Good morning. Welcome. If we haven't met before, my name's Trevor. I'm one of the pastors here at Beacon, and uh, I am so glad to be with you guys today and to be continuing in our, our series, Jonah. We're getting uh, a little closer to the end of this series, and uh, I don't know how it's been for you guys, but we've just loved this series. It's been really fun for us here at the, the church, and uh, sorry, I love technology, and at the same time, it can be a bit of a drag when all of a sudden you lose your notes right before the... <laughs> so don't mind me as I, I multitask here. Um, but uh, we've, we've just had a, a really good time with this series. And I, I remember when Robert called me uh, like a week before we started the series, we were, we were a little late in uh, kind of the planning of it. And he called and he's like, I think we're going to do Jonah for the summer. And I'm like, all summer? That's like 10 weeks. It's like four short chapters. How are we going to do 10 weeks in the book of Jonah? And, and yet here we are doing 10 weeks in the book of Jonah, and it feels like amazing. I, I just, I found so much in this book, more than I ever thought or realized could be there. And, uh, and I, I'm still struggling with my technology here. All right, I got it. All right. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're finally getting to the, the last chapter in the book of Jonah, and uh, it's, it's cool to finally see some of these pieces come together. And uh, when we jump onto the scene here in chapter four, if you have a Bible and you want to open up to chapter four, uh, Jonah is Jonah's just angry. He's very unhappy with the way that this story kind of worked out. And, uh, and it, it's funny because when we, we first met Jonah, uh, kind of for the sake of review, when we first met Jonah, God shows up and says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and let the city know that I'm going to destroy it in 40 days. And, and we never hear why or anything at the, the beginning, but Jonah just decides, eh, not going to do it. I'm going to go in the complete opposite direction and go down to Joppa, get a boat, and head for Tarshish. And God's like, that, that's not really what I want you to do. And so God sends a storm, and then Jonah gets thrown overboard. He's in a, a belly of a whale, and, and Jonah, you know, prays and thanks God for being rescued and everything like that. And then the whale vomits him out, and God again says, well, how about this time you actually go to Nineveh? And Jonah's like, all right, I'll go. And he goes, and he preaches to Nineveh that the city's going to be destroyed, and the people of Nineveh, they actually repent. And as they repent, God relents, and he decides, you know, I'm not going to destroy them anymore. And then we find Jonah here in chapter 4, verse 1. And as Jonah watches this, as he watches the repentance of the Ninevites and God relenting from judging, uh, judging them in his wrath, and it says that to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I, I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord says, is it right for you to be angry? It's kind of a... Uh, not a, a high moment in the life of Jonah, where he actually sees this awesome work of God and this amazing interaction where these horrible, wicked people actually repent and, and turn to God, and, and God relents, and, and Jonah is just angry. He's livid about this whole situation, and, and it's easy to harp on Jonah, to look at this and, and just think he's being petty, and, and hypocritical, and, and he is being hypocritical. You know, just a, a couple chapters earlier, the last time, the only other time he prays in this, uh, this whole book of Jonah, he prays to thank God, essentially for being gracious and compassionate. But now, now he's angry. And it, it seems like just sheer hypocrisy. And we look at him and we're like, Jonah, come on, pull yourself together. Stop melting down. He looks like a, you know, a toddler here. <clears throat> but I actually... I think that Jonah's reaction here is probably more, uh, more normal and more relatable than we might imagine. Because Jonah's not just upset that Nineveh repented and God relented and God showed them mercy when he could have just destroyed them and, and they deserve it or something. But Nineveh was a, a clear and present threat to the nation of Israel. The Ninevites were 
were horrible. They were part of this great empire called Assyria, and they were, they were terrible, and they were powerful. You guys are familiar with what's going on in the Middle East right now, the, the armies of ISIS, and what they're doing, and these just horrible atrocities. Uh, ironically, they actually just destroyed Jonah's tomb. Um, but they, uh, they're doing these, these horrible, horrible things, and the Ninevites were very much like this. They were just bent on destruction, and they had no remorse, and they had no decency, and no dignity about it, and, and they were just wicked, wicked people. But not just that they, they were bad, but they were a threat. They were, they were constantly a threat to the nation of Israel. Like, imagine if, uh, for instance, the, the armies of ISIS continue to grow in power, and, and they overtake the Middle East, and, and then they conquer Africa, and then they come up and they, they conquer the European Union, and, and then they're at the shores of the Atlantic, and they're looking across to us, and, and they're bent on destruction. And at this point, they're, they're more powerful than we are. They have more resources. They uh, are, are just so ruthless, and, and they are looking across, bent on destruction. And all of a sudden, you find God is going to intervene. God is going to do something about the armies of ISIS, and what God decides to do is to forgive them. <laughs> This is where Jonah is. He's not just upset because of what they've done. He's upset because of what they, they can do. All right, God, you're going to forgive them. What happens next? You know, Germany, you know, after World War I, they said they were sorry. And then World War II happened. Like, how long, how long is this, you know, this repentance even going to last and what happens next? And, and it turns out that Jonah's concerns were valid because within, you know, a couple of generations, the Assyrian army comes in and it wipes out Israel. <laughs> It wasn't like just some, you know, vague idea. It, it actually happened eventually. And Jonah, he's, he's actually concerned. He's grieving over the status of Israel. Not just because of the forgiveness of Nineveh, but this is a, a, a present threat. God just compromised the nation of Israel by forgiving them. And, and he's angry. And I'm not going to lie. I've I've gotten angry with God uh, about much more trivial things than national security. <laughs> uh, it, it's true. There, there are times when, when God just acts in certain ways, and, and I don't get it. And it, it frustrates me. And, and anger starts to, to build up inside of me. And, and I think we all have these things. What are, what are the things that cause you to get angry? What are your, your boiling points? You know, does it uh, you know, have to do with your finances? Does it have to do with your relationship status? Does it have to do with maybe the way people treat you? Uh, does it have to do with traffic? Uh, you know, there, what, are, what are your boiling points, the things that, that cause you to get angry? It's normal for us to get angry. In fact, you know, if you, you look at this as, as grieving, it, it's very normal. Are you guys familiar with the stages of grief? Anybody take like a psychology class ever? Uh, the, the stages of grief. You guys, you guys know what they are? I think there's, there's five of them. There's what? Denial. Uh, any other? <laughs> Anger. Yeah, that's one of them. Uh, bargaining. Absolutely. Uh, what is it? Acceptance. That's uh, the last one. That's hopefully where all this is leading. Uh, and, then, and then depression. And we actually see Jonah kind of go through all five of these stages. Denial, yeah, he gets in a boat and heads in the opposite direction. Starts bargaining with God, uh, you know, using his own life as a bargaining chip. He, he's, anger, he's angry with God here, and he, he gets depressed. And uh, he, he never actually gets to acceptance, it, at least not in the book. Maybe we can imagine that after this, he finally accepted it. But, but this is normal. This is how we, we grieve as humanity. And, and psychologists, they say that this is, this is pretty ubiquitous. Like, you know, you go anywhere in the world, and it's, you know, there might be variations, and the order might change, but it is normal for us to grieve in this way. It's normal for us to get angry. And maybe you're not the angry type. Maybe you're not the one who kind of like overflows and boils with that rage and, and emotion. Maybe you're the kind of like get down and sulk and maybe go to despair, you know, a little less George Costanza, a little more Eeyore. Uh, but, but both sentiments are essentially saying the same thing, that I'm, I'm dissatisfied with what God is doing. I'm dissatisfied with what God is doing. And this is, this is a normal way to grieve. But is it, is it good? Is it right? 
Just because it's normal, does that mean it, it's how we should grieve? Even as we, we look at Jonah here and we, we see it, just kind of as we, we read it, we're like, it just doesn't feel right. And at the end, God says, is it, is it right for you to be angry? It might be normal, but it's, it's not innocent. And, and here's why. Uh, as we've been going through Jonah, we've pointed out some of the different Hebrew terms that have been used in this passage and the different ways and uh, some really, really fascinating things. Last week, Robert talked about the word great, uh, the Hebrew word gadol, uh, if you were here last week, and just the way it's repeated throughout the, the text. And here uh, as well, there's another word that's repeated throughout the text, and it's uh, the term, the Hebrew term is ra. And it's a hard word to translate, uh, apparently, because in the, the nine times that it's used in this short little book, it's translated seven different ways. So it's translated as wickedness, as calamity, as trouble, as uh, discomfort, as wrong, as evil, and as destruction. Seven different ways of the nine times that it's used, but you, you can kind of get a sense. It's just bad. <laughs> it's just the the badness. And, and half the time it's used to talk about the evil that the Ninevites are doing, their evil actions, their wickedness. And, and another half of the time it's talking about the, the calamity and destruction that God is going to bring or that God does bring, like God's wrath, the, the bad things that he's going to do because of their bad things. And so when you get to the end of chapter 3, in verse 10, it says, when God saw that they, uh, what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, from their ra'ah, their bad, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction, the ra'ah, that he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, very ra'ah. So essentially, the Ninevites, they were, they were doing bad, but then they, they repented from their bad, and God relented from bringing his bad, and Jonah saw this and said, this is very bad. <laughs> This is, this is very bad. And he actually, he actually makes a, a moral judgment about God's behavior, about God's actions. And whether we, we verbalize it or not, or whether we, we actually think through it this way or not, when we express a, a disappointment with God, like a, a, an anger with God or, or depression with God or despair, we are, we are communicating, we are making a statement about God's actions, saying that we disapprove of your actions. Here in the text, it says, in Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed wrong. Have you ever been in a position where you've seen what God has done, and you're just like, this just seems wrong. <laughs> this seems wrong. And it, it causes us to, to get angry or to go down to the pits of, of depression and despair because we just we, we can't agree with it. It just feels wrong. And I don't know about you, I don't like getting angry. I don't like losing my temper. I don't actually like despair either. Neither of these feel like good places to be. And I don't think anybody ever wants to be in either of these two camps. And yet it, it just sneaks up on us sometimes, right? Like there are times where you don't expect it. It's just, boom, out it comes. And it might be over serious issues or it might be over trivial things. Uh, you know, it, it's so funny. My dad is probably one of the most gracious kindest, most generous people I know. He'll bend over backwards for anybody. He can take anything in stride except red lights. <laughs> red light. He just flips out at red lights, like beating the steering wheel. I'm like, what are you? Uh, but we all have these different things that when they go, when they go wrong, it just kind of boils out of us. And, and it's easy for us to, to get angry and say, this is just wrong. And God sees this as a teachable moment for Jonah. And, and so in this, he says, is it, is it right for you to be angry? And then overnight, God gives Jonah a little gift. He lets his vine grow up over top of him, and it provides him nice shade in the heat of the day. And Jonah is so happy, kicking back under the shade. And then the next night, God allows it to die. And Jonah wakes up, and once again, he's angry. And, he's, and, he's, uh, and, and God says again, in, in the same way, he says, is it right for you to be angry? He's like, yes, it is. He took this away. But you didn't, you didn't grow the—you didn't tend to it. This, it grew up overnight. It went away overnight. And God links these, these two together by, by saying in, in the same way, do you have the right to be angry? And, and he's trying to point out in Jonah that this anger, the reason why it's boiling up, it's not just because Jonah isn't getting what he wants. You know, we, we all have 
times in life where we don't get what we want. That's just kind of part of life. And, you know, we're all adults and we kind of take it in stride and we move on. But there are other times, there are things that we just can't seem to let go of. They, they boil up and they come out of us and we can't even, we don't even know why they bother us so much. But, but God points out with this that, that Jonah, when this vine came up, immediately latched onto it and he felt like it was, it was his. Like it wasn't, it wasn't just something that he wanted, but it, it belonged to him. And when God took it away from him, he was taking away something, not that he wanted, but that he, he deserved. And the same thing was happening as God compromised the nation of Israel. God was, was jeopardizing not just what Jonah wanted, but what Jonah believed he deserved. There was this sense of entitlement. God was, was actually infringing upon his rights. And when that happens, it's not, it's not so easy to just let go of. When that happens, that, that anger will boil up or, or that depression, that despair will set in. Because it's more serious than just not getting what we want. I, uh, I'm going to share a personal story with you, as long as you promise not to judge me too harshly. Um, but uh, before I met my wife, I was single for like a long time, and I didn't like that. Uh, and, it, it, you know, as time kind of passed and my singleness remained, I kind of grew a little more upset about this. And, and more and more, the, the weight of this and the unsettledness of it kind of pressed upon me. And eventually I started to get angry. And I, I started to get angry at God. And what's interesting is I wasn't angry that God didn't give me what I want. I wasn't angry that God didn't give me a wife. Because I knew that he didn't owe me a wife. You know, like it wasn't, it wasn't his job to provide this for me. I could be single for the rest of my life. Like that's fully in his prerogative. And, and I understood that and I accepted that. And I, I, you know, I told people that. But what I couldn't what I couldn't accept is how unsettled I was. And I started to, to just get angry at God. And I remember one night, it was like, I think it was January 1st of, I don't know, years ago. Um, and I, I was like right here on this spot, on this stage. It was like a Sunday and nobody was around. The building was closed. It was all to me. And I just had a screaming match with God because I was so angry with God because, uh, it, not because he didn't give me what I wanted, but because he, he wouldn't give me the peace of mind about the situation. For me, it was a feeling. It was an emotion. I felt like God owed me. All right, you don't want to give me the wife. That's fine. But at least just let me have some peace about it. At least let me feel settled. And I, I felt like this was, this was something I deserved. And when he didn't give it to me, it, it just made me angry. What are, what are your inalienable rights? Not the ones that are talked about in the Constitution. But what are the things that if God tampers with... Do you feel like, this is, this is mine. <laughs> you, you owe me this. You can't take this away. You know, is it, is it a marital status? Is it a feeling like what I experienced? Is it a, a financial status? Is it, you know, your kids' well-being? What are the, the things that you feel like, these are, these are mine, and I, I earned them. I deserve them. And if you take them away... I'm not going to be okay with that. God started to, to pull on these strings in Jonah's life, compromising the nation of Israel. And so he, he lashes out to God, and he says three things here. He says, isn't this what I said when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, the Lord, now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. So he says three things. That's why I fled to Tarshish. I knew you were gracious and compassionate. By the way, if, if you're going to get into an argument with God, accusing him of being gracious and compassionate as, as, as if it's a bad thing probably isn't a great way to start. Um, but he says, I knew you were gracious and compassionate. And the third thing he says is, so take my life, because it's better for me to die. And as we read these, for us, it probably, nothing jumps off the pages because we aren't Hebrews who kind of grew up with the Hebrew text. And, but with each of these, these phrases, they're allusions to other texts in the Old Testament, other Hebrew texts. And as I, I stumbled across this, I, was, I found it so fascinating because in it, the author is, is carefully exposing Jonah's tragic flaw in all of this. 
the, the first, he says, I'm going to flee to Tarshish. And it, it alludes back to this passage in Isaiah 66. Actually, we looked at this passage in the early weeks, why Jonah chose Tarshish to flee to. And then he, he talks about God's grace and compassion. Well, this is a direct quote from the prophet Joel. And, and it, we'll go to the text there in a minute to look at how that culminates. But then this third thing, he, he says, take my life. The scholars suggest that this is an allusion to Moses. Moses, I don't know if you remember this, but when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, the Israelites were growing a little impatient. And so down at base camp, they built an idol to, you know, thank this golden calf for delivering them from Egypt. And God's like, you should probably get back down there. Uh, they, they need some help. And so he goes back down and God's, you know, God is angry at his people. And, and Moses actually offers up his life. He says, God, blot me out of this story, but let them. And the argument in all three of these, if uh, we can pull up the next slide, you can kind of see them all together. Exodus 32, Joel 2, 17, and Isaiah 66, 19. It says, uh, and Isaiah I will set a sign among them. They will proclaim God's glory, my glory among the nations. In Joel, it says, don't make God's inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. In Exodus, why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that God brought them out? In all three cases, in Joel, Isaiah, and, and Moses' situation, all three of them, they're pleading on behalf of the nation of Israel for the sake of God's reputation among the nations. All three times, the argument is the same. God, don't do this for us. Do this for you. Because Moses and Isaiah and Joel, they all understood that, Isaiah, that Israel, the nation of Israel, played a key role and a very, very important role in God's story. Jonah's tragic flaw is that he, he got things confused. And he started to treat God as a key player in Israel's story. God was now serving Israel's glory. God was now the one who was supposed to show up to, to make sure that, that Israel, that the nation of Israel was able to, you know, be able to prevail. And, and this, this question, this confusion is at the heart of all entitlement. Are you a key player in God's story? Are you just, are you playing a supporting role in God's story? Or, or have you reduced God to playing a supporting role in your story? Is God just a, a supporting actor in the story of Joe? Is God just a, a supporting actor in the story of James? If God is playing a supporting story, role in your story, then you will actually experience a lot of great displeasure. A lot of upset. Because God's story is always going to win out. I mean, look what happened to Jonah. He tried as best as he could to change the story, to rewrite it. But in the end, God's story is always going to win out. And God isn't going to let us just reduce him to being a supporting character in our story, where we become the author. And this might seem like, a, you know, it's my way or the highway thing, and, and it is actually with God, but it's, it's also good. You know, it's a little scary to let go of our story and, and latch on to God's, but in God's story, God's story is for your benefit. You know, in, in Romans, Paul says that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. His story really is for our benefit. Jonah couldn't figure this out. Jonah thought the only way that the story could benefit Israel and his people and his way of life is if it was God supporting his story. But God's story is so good for us, and we know this because God wrote himself into the story. He became a character just like one of us. And that character that, that God made man, Jesus, went to the cross to die for you. That's the climax of the story. It all rests upon what he was willing to sacrifice for you, and he's willing to do so much more. This story is all for you. But as long as we, we latch onto our story, it's just going to set us up for this, this disappointment over and over and over again. And so how do we, how do we make the switch? 
How do we let go of our story and latch on to God's? Uh, you know, if, you, if you're in a period now where you're, you are experiencing just disappointment and anger or disappointment and despair, I encourage you to just ask this question. Am I, am I reducing God to a supporting role in my story? But maybe you're not experiencing this right now. Uh, you will. Uh, we all we all do. We all experience times where uh, things just don't go as we expect, and it, you know it can be painful and difficult. Uh, so I want to give you a, a couple of tools to help you start to plan now, start to live now for God's story. And so it's just too very simple to turn and embrace. Turn and embrace. Uh, in uh, Martin Luther, he, you know, wrote the 95 Thesis. You familiar with the 95 Thesis? Um, I, I don't expect you to be familiar with all 95. I wasn't either. But the first one, uh, it, it starts off by saying this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be of repentance. The, the term repent just means to turn, to turn away from ourselves. To turn, and he says that it's meant to be uh, part of our lives, an everyday sort of thing, constantly turning, constantly repenting, because our default is to always just go back to our story, go back to doing our thing. And so we wake up in the morning and, and we ask God, God, help me know your will. Help me choose your, uh, you know, the things that you want to do. Help me turn away from the, the idols in my life, to turn away from my own agenda. We repent daily, constantly just training our minds to turn from our own way to God. And, and the second thing we do is embrace. Embrace God's story. See, God's story is going to happen no matter what, and it can either happen to you or it can happen through you. And Jonah is the rare exception where it still happened through him, kind of, uh, but unwillingly. And in the end, when, when God's story smacked Jonah in the face, he just got angry. He was so upset. But if we embrace God's story, then God's story, it's not something that happens to us. It's actually something that happens through us. When we embrace God's story with our hearts, our passions, our, uh, our, our very lives, and we're trying to bring about his story, playing the, the best supporting role we can play in his story, then his story becomes our story. His success becomes our success. Jonah could never do this. Jonah, he wasn't able to, to let go. And so, you know, in the end, he was, he was angry when he could have been rejoicing. If from the beginning, if he embraced God's story, he would have been rejoicing about the amazing work that God had done, but it was, it was lost on him because he was so fixated on his own story. But if, if we can embrace it, we actually offer a, a class uh, periodically throughout the year here at Beacon called the Place Class. And the Place Class is, is really geared to help us find our place in God's story to find how your, your gifts and your abilities and your passions and your experiences and your, your personality, how all of these things come together for what God is doing in this world, for the story that he is telling. And, and if you've never taken this class, I, I really encourage you. We're offering it again September 6th. And uh, it's a Saturday thing, like a nine to one seminar. And uh, those of you who have taken it, you know how enlightening it is. But this is a, a tremendous tool to help you embrace God's story. Because it's one thing to just kind of turn uh, and, and, you know, tell yourself, you know, I, I, I want to live for God. I want to live for God. But unless we're actually living for God, unless we're actually doing something with our lives to embrace his story, to bring it about, his story will always be something that just kind of happens to us. And, and it doesn't feel good. <laughs> but if we embrace it, if we turn, we, f we really do repent, make a, a lifestyle of repentance and embrace his story, we can, we can celebrate his victories we can take hold of uh, all his, his, uh, his winnings and his championship, his glory. It becomes something that we can share and join in. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your unbelievable grace in our lives. 
God, I pray that you will reveal to us the, the areas in our life that we're, we're holding on to, that we're trying to uh, be in control of, insisting that you participate in our lives in the way that we want you to and using you, God, as a, a tool in our tool chest. God, I, I pray that we will humble ourselves, that we'll turn away from our own agendas, our own desires, and embrace your goodness. Embrace the, the story that you're telling, God, knowing full well that your story is, is so good for us and for all of humanity, for all of creation. Pray that you'll give us the, the strength and the wisdom to turn and embrace. We love you so much, and we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.